absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We're so thankful that you've given us your word. Father, it would be so difficult to live in this world without any guidance, without knowing where things are leading to. But you have provided us with information about what is happening and what will happen before the coming of Jesus. We know that one of the great deceptions of Satan will be uh, personifying the dead. In other words, appearing as our supposed dead relatives. He's going to use spiritualism as one of his great instruments in deceiving the human race. And even Christians, Father, we know, use many of these texts to try and prove that when a person dies, their soul goes to heaven. And as we study this evening the passage about the souls under the altar, we ask, Father, that you will give us divine wisdom. Help us to understand what the Bible is truly saying in this very difficult passage. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. Now while you're looking for that passage, I just want to give you a little bit of context so we know where that passage fits within the structure of Revelation. This passage that we're going to read is actually a description of the fifth seal of the book of Revelation. Now probably most of you know that Revelation presents seven seals. This seal is number five. Now many of those who have studied the seals have concluded, and I have concluded this on the basis of many years of study, that the seals are actually describing Christian history from the days of the apostles till the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. In other words, the seven seals are describing certain eras or period, periods of the history of the Christian church from apostolic times till the end of the age. Now, the first seal would represent the church of the apostles that goes out conquering and to conquer. The second seal, which is a red horse, represents the period of the church during the persecutions of the Roman Empire, like Nero and so on. The third horse, or the third seal, uh, is a black horse. And that represents the period during Constantine the Great's time, when many of the errors and superstitions that are not found in the Bible penetrated and came into the church. The fourth horse, which is a pale one, it's also the fourth seal, represents the church during the period of the Middle Ages. It is the horse of death. It's the period during which God's people are martyred because they want to remain faithful to the message of God. And then we have the passage that we're going to study this evening, the passage that deals with the fifth seal. Now let's go in our Bibles there to Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, and read what we find in these very important verses. It says there, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. The fifth seal describes the martyrs of Jesus that were slain 
during the second seal of the second horse, the red horse, the imperial persecutions, and those who were slain under the period of the fourth horse, the yellow horse, the horse of death, the martyrs under the fifth seal who were slain in the previous seals are crying out to God from under the altar because they have been slaughtered in these persecutions. Now we have several questions that we want to answer concerning this passage and I'll go through them one by one. First, when does this scene take place? The one that we just read about. Well, we've already provided most of the context that we're going to deal with. Secondly, which altar were these souls under? What altar is being talked about here? Number three, why were they killed? Why were these individuals killed? Number four, what were they praying about? What were they crying out about? And why were they crying out? Number five, what do the white robes that were given them represent? Number six, why were they told to rest for a little season until the rest of the martyrs would be killed as they were? And of course the next question I just answered in the previous one, is there more than one group of martyrs? And finally, when will the pleas of these martyrs be answered? So those are the questions that we want to answer in our study today. Now in order to understand the cry of the martyrs from under the altar, we need to go to some Old Testament background. So go with me to Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. It's speaking here about the story of Cain and Abel. And probably even those who don't read the Bible very much are acquainted with the story of Cain and Abel, at least the broad strokes. It says there in Genesis 4 verse 1, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but then we're told that God did not respect the offering of Cain. Why did God respect the offering of Abel but not respect the offering of Cain? The simple fact is, the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God had asked for an animal sacrifice. He had shown it in Genesis 3 verse 21. When the first animals were sacrificed, the skins were taken to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. God show, uh, showed them that the only way their nakedness, the nakedness of sin could be covered was through the death of the animal. Cain and Abel knew that. Abel obeyed God and worshiped God the way God said that you're supposed to worship and he brought the animal sacrifice. Cain, on the other hand, disobeyed God. He worshiped God as he pleased, and he brought the grain or the fruit of the ground. And therefore God accepted the offering of Abel, but he rejected the offering of Cain. You see, this original controversy had to do with obedience and worship. Abel obeyed God and worshiped God according to the way that God had established. Now, the fact that God had blessed the offering of Abel made Cain very angry. Notice Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Notice that the disobedient one, the one who practices false worship, now is filled with anger against the one who was obedient and the one who worshiped God the way God had commanded. Genesis 4 verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So you'll notice in this story that the disobedient one, the one who practiced false worship, kills the obedient one who practiced true worship. In other words, the unrighteous slays the righteous. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, and I'm going to show you that Abel is called righteous in Scripture. 